Good morning, church. How you guys doing today? Looking good. Everybody's scurrying around trying to find their seat. Like somebody turned on the light and the cockroaches. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, got the dog section over here. You never know what will show up at Church in the Woods. Last Sunday I hear that Gail captured a baby rabbit right there. I'm happy to report the baby rabbit's still alive. Spending the weekend over at the lake with my grandson. (laughs) We did have a moment of terror there. And uh, he crawled out of the box, and they couldn't find him. And they falsely accused the dog <laughs> because he was in the house. And then they extended their hunt to the outside and falsely accused the cats. But as it turned out, that night, in the middle of the night, he hopped on the bed. So <laughs> he'd been he'd been running around all day in their house and if you've ever looked at a house with two boys you, you can imagine there's no place that rabbit can't hide so he hid but they that which was lost was found so and I gave him a cage and now he's on his first road trip to Lake Placid so Another soul was saved by Gail. <laughs> All right. Now, you guys might be wondering. Some of you know me well enough that you're not wondering. You know I'm crazy in the house. But you might be wondering why it is I do not have my customary black hat on today. People know why. This hat and this shirt is actually... I felt was appropriate for Memorial Day. You see, Memorial Day is the day we honor those who, in our military, were killed in action. And today, in honor of Gary Englehart, 22-year-old from Indiana, John Regler, 21-year-old from Tampa, and Guy Mears, 20-year-old from Georgia. On October 17th, Saturday morning, about 10 or 11, mid-morning, they got a call to go pick up some wounded soldiers. The unit that I'm honoring today is the dust off unit. Dust off probably doesn't mean much to most of you, but it's a call sign used during the Vietnam War for medical evacuation of wounded. As a matter of fact, that war was the first war that was extensively used. They practiced a little bit of it during the Korean War. But because of the dust off units, it was possible for a wounded soldier in combat to be on an operating table in a rear hospital in less than an hour from the time he was wounded, which is called the golden hour. As a consequence, those who made it to the hospital, 96% of them lived. They actually made it through. Now, dust off is a call sign that was developed early on and continued all the way through. And it represented a crew of four men, two pilots, the crew chief, and a medic. 
those four men had their own personal weapons, but the helicopter itself was not armed with machine guns or rockets or anything. Instead, what they had was a red cross on the side and on the nose. Now, we quickly found out that our enemy did not appreciate the rules of war as put out by the Geneva Convention, and they decided they would use that Red Cross as a target rather than respect it as a helicopter ambulance. On that Saturday morning, on October 9th, uh, 17th, 1970, the crew was called to pick up wounded soldiers in a coastal mountain area. And as they flew in and came down to a hover, they were not able to land because the terrain was too rocky and mountainous, treed. And so what they typically did was to hover above the wounded and drop a, a cable with a little seat called a jungle penetrator on it. And they dropped it down. The guys put him on the wounded, tie him on there, and they raise him back up. While they were preparing to hoist, it was called a hoist mission, while they were preparing to hoist him, their ship was struck with an RPG, a rocket pro propelled grenade in the tail section. Helicopters, as you know, are fragile instruments. Somebody has described them as a, a millions of metal pieces swirling around an oil leak. And when the tail section goes, there's no more control. The pilots lost control and crash immediately. Now, the two pilots, Gary and John, were killed instantly as the rotor, main rotor blades slashed through the cockpit. The medic, preparing for the hoist mission, undoubtedly, was thrown out of the helicopter and landed on his back on the rocks and broke his back. He survived. The crew chief, once the crash was completed, was able to move and was trying his best to get the two pilots out of their chairs when the helicopter exploded into flames. He sustained third burns all over his body and died on the way to a transfer hospital down in Cameron Bay. These men I've never forgotten and never will. But Memorial Day is that day when we remember such people. We remember their willingness to sacrifice their lives in defense of our country. These men deserve our time to recollect, understand what they did, and to appreciate the distinction and valor that they displayed that Saturday morning. Of the entire dust-off units, over 250 crew members were lost during the war, which if you figured it out to a 10-year war, that amounts to about 25 a year, which is an average of two, a little over two a month were killed during the war. That Saturday broke the record the three that month. Now, I'm saying all that just to honor their service. 
is to honor them for what they were willing to do. I found out after, years after, I'd left. The dust off was a volunteer service, completely volunteer. And if you at any time didn't like it or couldn't take it or had enough, you could walk away and nobody would say a word. Of course, I didn't find that out until afterwards. <laughs> See, these men were willing to sacrifice their lives. As a result, they became known as a bunch of crazies. And they earned the respect not only of their fellow crew members, as they worked together and fought together, survived together, but they also earned the respect of those grunts on the ground, those guys running around out in the fields and the jungles and the rice paddies, who knew if they were wounded, they had a good chance of being in surgery in less than an hour because of dust off. So I want to take this moment as we start our service for Memorial Day to remember these men, to thank them for their service, and to encourage you, each one of you, to remember those you've lost in service for our country. Okay, church. I don't know how many of you noticed it, but up there in our <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> up there in our <coughs> in our sound booth. Everybody, turn and look at David. Wave, David. All right, that little flag below him is the Memorial Day flag. And, of course, it's got the Lest We Forget text on it, but it also has uh, various soldiers, primarily, if you look closely at their helmets, <coughs> those are World War I soldiers. The helmet's distinctive. And the reason they're World War I helmets is because you also see that red poppy flower in the background. That red poppy flower came to recognize and remember the fallen soldiers after World War I. In fact, uh, this fellow wrote a poem about it. He was so impressed with the poppies that were growing over the land that was a battleground, the land that was soaked with blood from soldiers, that he wrote a poem entitled In Flanders Field, in which he recognized the poppies growing there and their significance. And ever since then, the red poppy, one single poppy, uh, represents Remembering a fallen soldier. So today, <clears throat> I don't have poppies to give you. Uh, however, I can tell you the VFW sells them, right? <laughs> okay. You can go to the VFW and buy one for a buck or something. <coughs> Wear it in your lapel, and it tells people around you, I remember. I remember. Now, for years, I struggled with two separate compartments in my brain, in my mind. I had one compartment, which was kind of a dark place, that I had walled off, sealed off, and put up guards around. Then I had another compartment in which God lived. The first secret compartment was a compartment of war. 
the compartment of the horrors of war, seeing the atrocities, seeing the carnage of war. That compartment I locked up. The moment I got back into civilian clothes, I said, I ain't never going to go in there again. Nothing good in there. Everything needs to stay in there. I'm not going to go in there. And I'm not going to let anybody else go in there. That compartment became my secret little compartment in my brain that I figured I had under lock and chain sealed off forever. And I proceeded to focus in on the other compartment, and that was God, His blessings, His goodness. But whenever I thought of the dark compartment, I thought, no, God wasn't in that. Mm -mm. There's no God in there. As much e evil as I witness, there can't possibly be God in that. The only compartment I would allow my mind to go to was the God that I knew before that compartment was developed somewhat, and the God I learned about after as I focus my attention on that God. What I learned years later was there's no way to keep a lid on that dark compartment. You think you're, you're doing it. You think you're covering it. But every now and then, usually at the time you least expect it, that lid blows off, and here comes all the junk. For the next several years, I decided, well, that's all right. If it blows up every now and then. I'll just collect all the junk, put it back in there, and lock it. That worked for a few years until the junk became overwhelming. So I couldn't collect it all and put it back in anymore. I had to face it. I had to deal with it. Now, unless you think this is just something that's common or reserved for warriors, for soldiers, let me help you make the connection. Each one of you have that kind of compartment. Yeah, you may have different stuff in it, but you've got that kind of compartment. It's a compartment in which you've locked everything you didn't want to face again into. Now, what I have discovered the hard way was it takes a lot of guards to keep that compartment secure. You know that? You've got to have a lot of guards. Because without the guards, that junk in there will rumble and grow and explode. And what I found out over years over the years was you only have so many guards. Because those guards that you have in place over that dark compartment are also those you use to guard the rest of your life in the normal compartments of your everyday life. But you only have so many. Let's say you're lucky and you have a hundred guards. You can use most of them, 50 or more, on your everyday life stuff. But more and more, that dark compartment requires more guards, better strategies. 
when you go on year after year after year living like that, pretty soon, out of that hundred yards that you had, you're going to have to be, to deploy 90 of them over here on that dark compartment. All of your energy, all of your strength to live your life goes to holding that compartment closed. Then this life, your everyday life, begins to fall apart and fail. Why? Because you don't have enough guards. You haven't got the energy to live your life holding all this dark stuff down. What we've been studying here in the book of Galatians is about Christian liberty. And I want to define that a little differently for you today in terms of that metaphor I just used. Christian liberty actually refers to setting free all hundred guards to live your life. Because God has dealt with that dark compartment. Doesn't mean it's not there. Doesn't mean that the things you stuffed into that dark department compartment aren't still there. They're still there. They're very real. They're memories and they'll never go away. But you've allowed God to set you, your guards free. You've allowed God to release the rest of your guards to live your everyday life. That process is somewhat difficult for us to understand. It's almost impossible for us to do. That's why God intervened. And so when Paul's talking about Christian liberty here, he's talking about dealing with that dark compartment first and foremost. He's not talking about you doing whatever you want to with this other part of your life. He's talking about the freedom from that dark compartment, the liberty that God gives you. On one occasion, as he began to deal with me on it, probably going back 25 years I found myself trying to stuff down inside and keep locked up the memories and the accompanying emotions particularly rage grief trying to stuff that all down and we got triggered and here it came it was on a Saturday evening and I had to go be spiritual the next morning with my dark apartment my dark compartment and all its junk hanging all over me how am I going to go be spiritual I had no clue. But I found something out that day. The key to dealing with that dark compartment. I went to church that morning. Not planning on doing it. But I actually confessed, I actually agreed with not only God and myself, but every other person that was there, that the biggest culprit in that dark compartment I was fighting was hatred. I confess that I hated the enemy, hated the NBA, hated the Viet Cong, hated the U.S. government for sending me there, hated the war protesters, hated the people who were making money off of it. 
And that dark compartment was filled with hatred, boiling over. Unfortunately, that hatred that I had stored down there, when it poked its ugly head up, when it started to run loose, Sandy was the first one to get it. The people closest to you. You don't mean to. It's not intentional. It just pops out, and before you can put it back, it does its job on other people. It hurts other people. But that morning, I learned something. I learned with when you will agree with it. When you will recognize that dark compartment filled with hatred before God and yourself and another human being. You've done the beginnings of what the 12-step AA program calls the fifth step. And there you begin to find relief. There you begin to discover something. That dark compartment in your brain, it begins to shrink. There's not, a, not as much emotion because you released it. You were honest with it and you dealt with it. Sometime later, I was asked by a Christian school come and address the kids on Veterans Day. There was another learning experience straight from God. I went with fear and trepidation. And when I got up to speak, I actually voiced the question that had been in that dark compartment for years in my mind that I was afraid to address. You see, I carried on my life in, in the normal compartment with uh, however many guards I had at the time, right? I carried on my life, and that involved being a preacher, being a pastor, while keeping a substantial cadre of guards on that dark compartment, that dark compartment, holding it down. And so I went to put on my best show in front of these kids on Veterans Day as a pastor. I mean, after all, it's a Christian school, right? And to my amazement, up popped this deep, dark question. that I had locked down for probably 30 years. That question hit my mind like a thunderbolt as soon as I stood up to speak. And I really didn't have any choice but to just blurt it out. So I blurted it out. I said, where was God in Vietnam? There it is. There's that question. Out in the public arena now. And you're a pastor. You're supposed to know. And I had no clue. Until that moment. And God answered it. In my mind. So I gave it to the kids. Let me tell you where God was in Vietnam. God, who is love, was in every act of kindness, every act of love and compassion demonstrated throughout the whole world. You say, well, I don't see where that could possibly be. Well, you don't understand the bonds of warriors then. 
men who have lived together, fought together, and survived together have a bond. A bond of divine love that cannot be broken by time or distance. Those same men and ladies would do anything required to protect and to serve those they love. You've all heard stories of grenades thrown into a bunker and one man jumps on that grenade to save the lives of others, right? What caused him to do that? What motivated him? It's that love. The love of God. See, love doesn't come naturally to us. Not that kind of love. Divine love is a totally different thing than humanistic love. Humanistic love is convenient. Human, humanistic love is romantic. Humanistic love is all that. When we say, I love you, which we really mean, I love to be loved by you, baby. That's human love. Divine love does what is best, regardless of the cost. It's unconditional and sacrificial. That love being demonstrated over and over again in various ways was the love of God in Vietnam in any other world that we find ourselves in. That's where God was. Where was he? He was right slap dab in the middle. So when that question comes out of your dark place, where are you, God? I thought you loved me. I thought you cared for me. Where is God? Understand. He is right there in the middle of that dark place. Was at the time it happened and is today. Because God is love. Now you may not be able to see it as clearly as I saw it. The day I stood before those kids. But I recognized that God is not picky. No matter how dark the dark spot is. He's right there in the middle of it to set you free with a liberty wherewith Christ has made you free. And so Memorial Day reminds me of not just those who have fallen, but the ones they left behind. The survivors that keep on going. And I want to honor today those families of those who have fallen, those survivors of those who have fallen as well. Because to live with your own dark space because of that requires that supernatural love. One more connection I'll quit here today. Remember several weeks ago we were studying what Paul said, don't don't use your liberty as an occasion to the flesh to do whatever you feel like to make you feel good or look good. That's not why you're set free. You are set free from that dark spot so that you can exercise the same love and compassion that would cause a soldier to lay down his life for one another. And that's divine love. As Jesus put it to his disciples, greater love has no man than he laid down his life for his friends. That's divine love. The best way I can think of memorializing those who have fallen is to fulfill our sacred duty, not only in remembering them, but also in loving like they did. So Paul says, don't use your liberty as an occasion to the flesh, but by love, that same love, 
serve one another. I heard it said one time that to die for someone is easy and quick. But to live for someone takes the rest of your life in supernatural power. So as we honor our fallen, let's live for them as well. We, who continue in our lives and remain, have a sacred duty not only to remember that, but also to live a life of love for them as well, as they gave us that example. True Christian liberty. Let's pray together. Father God, as we come to your presence, I thank you and I praise you for the opportunity we have to come together this morning for your leadership and your spirit. I thank you, Father, for the celebration we have of the love and the life of those who gave their lives willingly for our freedom, for our safety, to protect and serve us. And we ask you, Father, to work that same spirit in each one of us today that we, like them, may be willing to lay down our lives one for another. So it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Appreciate you all being here. Go in peace. Now it's time for a barbecue, etc., etc. That's what we do on Memorial Day, right? In fact, I think I'm going over to check on that rabbit later. <laughs>